today's time, once we've uh, Diane as today's presenter, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Um, Diane is Professor of English and the Head of Department at City University, Hong Kong. Her research investigates aspects of English for academic purposes and second language writing, including source use and plagiarism, and the widespread and growing phenomenon of English medium uh, as a medium of instruction. She's designed and taught professional skills development courses for university teachers addressing questions such as how to work against plagiarism, how to promote students' writing skills and how to teach effectively in the English medium classroom. Her publications include Teaching to Avoid Plagiarism, that's Open University Press, and Student Plagiarism in Higher Education, Society for Research into Higher Education and Routledge with Philip Shaw. So. I'll just unmute your mic, Diane, and it's uh, over to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Simon, for the introduction. And thanks to everybody for joining us here. So there's something paradoxical about plagiarism, and that's sort of my starting point today. It's a legitimate source of concern in universities, and therefore it has to be something that EAP teachers think about as we prepare our students to engage in academic tasks. I'm just having a little bit of difficulty with my slides, which don't want to advance. Just just click click anywhere on it, and then you can tap I through. I have done. There we go. <laughs> right. Sorry about that. Um, right. So universities are doing more and investing more resources to combat plagiarism. In 2000, I published a survey of university plagiarism policies. And at that point, it wasn't unusual to find that some had no particular policy, uh, apart from telling students not to do it. That's much less likely to be the case today. There are policies and procedures, and we also increasingly spend money and spend time on text matching tools, um, products that call themselves plagiarism detection tools. Now, some people would say that universities need to do this because there's been an increase in the prevalence of plagiarism. It's not clear that this is the case, there is only a limited amount of evidence, and what there is doesn't point with certainty to an increase, but the Curtis and Bardenega article on the slide um, presents a really interesting perspective on this. If it's a question that interests you, it's worth a read. But whether or not plagiarism is increasing, we can agree that it hasn't disappeared. So this is the paradox. If we've done so much over the past couple of decades to combat plagiarism, why is it still around? So how do we explain that paradox? Plagiarism has a number of causes. One is that there will always be some students who want to do the wrong thing, who choose to do the wrong thing. But there are other explanations as well. There's an important distinction supported by a large body of research between plagiarism, which happens because the student decided to do the wrong thing, and plagiarism, which has some other cause. So, and now I'm going to engage in some very broad generalizations. Some students don't understand what's expected of them they can produce work without realizing that their teacher is likely to call it plagiarism. And some may understand that their writing strategies are not ideal, but are challenged to produce work which meets their teacher's expectations. And because many teachers, possibly most, but definitely not all, recognize that there are at least two distinct types of plagiarism, there's a wealth of terminology in the research literature to make that distinction. Now, I've used the term prototypical plagiarism for cases when the student meant to cheat. This is the deceptive kind, deliberate wrongdoing. And some people think that that's the only 
kind of behavior that deserves the name plagiarism. So alternative labels have been put forward and they include transgressive intertextuality, textual borrowing, and a particularly powerful and widely used one is the notion of patch writing, which was first used by Rebecca Howard. And she uses this as a label for the kind of writing which students do when they're first learning the language of academia and they're trying to mimic it. So patch writing is something that happens when writers don't set out on purpose to plagiarize, but nevertheless, the writing they produce looks like plagiarism. So why is it so hard to avoid that? A lot of teachers are prepared to accept that some students, depending on their background, may not understand what plagiarism is or why they shouldn't do it. But I've heard teachers say, right, once we've told a student what plagiarism is, once we've told that student not to do it, it's their responsibility. And for some teachers, suggesting that there are other explanations can sound a lot like making excuses for bad behavior. Now, we don't want to do that. Some people cheat. Some people cheat by plagiarizing, and that's not okay. And so it's perfectly reasonable to spend time and energy warning students not to plagiarize and trying to detect it if they do and penalizing it, them for it. But to go back to the starting point today, informing and warning, detecting and punishing, we're doing a lot of that. We're doing more of it than we were 20 years ago. And yet we haven't even come close to eliminating plagiarism. And there's a reason for that. That's because the warn, detect, and punish approach is only relevant to prototypical plagiarism, the cheating kind. For the others, prevention, depends on supporting writers to overcome their challenges in using sources to do academic writing. So what are those challenges? Well, they're really quite significant as this summary will show. First of all, to do academic writing, students must engage with sources. That's something that they can't avoid because Virtually all academic genres are, to some extent, built upon already existing work. So academic writing isn't like producing a poem or a short story, something that's supposed to come out of the writer's own imagination and nowhere else. Academic writing, virtually all academic genres are, to some extent, built upon already existing work. So academic writers don't have the option of staying away from other texts and relying entirely on the contents of their own heads. They have to learn how to work with sources and use them appropriately. And in order to do that, here are some of the skills they need. They need to be able to find relevant academic sources. So in other words, they need good information searching and library skills. And then they need to be able to read their sources and understand them. So that means things like being able to negotiate difficult academic vocabulary, complex grammatical structures, being able to read, navigate less familiar genres. And most academic writing is based not on one single source, but on multiple sources. So writers need to be able to synthesize the information they're gathering, information which is typically partially overlapping, partially in agreement, and partially contradictory. And then there's the task of 
retelling the parts that are relevant to the new text. We've all seen students try to include a summary of everything they've read, but good academic writing is selective about what it reuses from its sources. And then of course, there's the job of citing the sources. And this alone is quite complex. I've tried to encapsulate that complexity in these three umbrella criteria, transparently, effectively, and conventionally. So first, academic writers need to be transparent about how they've used their sources, usually by means of giving citations. I've discussed the notion of transparency at length elsewhere, but in a nutshell, what it means is the writer has to help the reader to understand what sources have been used and how they've been used. Beyond transparency, references should be effective in supporting the new text. So we've all come across students for whom everything is according to, or so-and-so said. And that's not as effective as using a range of reporting verbs well. And finally, source use, like many other things, is heavily dependent on discipline-specific conventions. So for example, we often tell students that if they use words from their source, they should use quotation marks. But in fact, in the natural sciences, quotations aren't commonly used at all. So a student who takes that advice might avoid being accused of plagiarism, but she wouldn't get a very good grade. So in short, and I think this is, if anything, a, a, a highly condensed version of what writers need to do, in order to write effectively using sources, students need good academic literacy skills. And that's where EAP teachers come in. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to exemplify how academic literacy skills are important and how we can work with them by offering examples of activities, three activities, which address different source use skills. They're aimed at different levels, and each one can be further adapted to students at a higher or a lower level. So one way that we learn about doing academic writing is through our reading. By reading the work of people in our field, we come to understand what the field prizes in terms of academic writing. This activity encourages students to notice what other writers are doing, and it encourages them to make this noticing a conscious practice. It also raises awareness of the signals that writers use to indicate how they view sources and of the fact that readers are very much dependent on writers using those signals effectively. So in this activity, students are given a, a short, a very short text, or rather an extract from one. And the simple instruction is to try to understand how the writer of that text has used sources. The same text is used, by the way, for the first two activities I'm going to show, and it's invented. Now, of course, there are some people who feel very strongly that authentic examples are always better, but I find that for this purpose, an exception is in order and invented examples work better because they keep students from focusing on the content of the source. And that frees up their attention for the way the content is reported. So we have a, a, a rather silly, hopefully mildly entertaining example that's been invented, but it's absolutely possible if you feel very strongly about authentic examples, it's certainly possible to adapt these activities to use in principle any source text. So here's the short text extract, and I'll just pause here and give you a minute to read it.
So in this short extract, we have four citations, which would tend to signal that work from other writers is being used here. And now there are some specific questions for students about it. And the first is, well, I should say all of the questions are about who is given responsibility or who takes responsibility for various propositions. And the first is the proposition that the moon is made of green cheese. And the answer to that is the author called Cheddar is being given responsibility for this proposition. And the next question is, who is it who says that Cheddar's work has been very significant? And the answer, of course, is that it's Stilton who says that. Stilton called this the century's greatest contribution to astrophysics. And the next question is, who is it who says that Cheddar's findings might not be true for all of the moon? And that, of course, is attributed to Brie, who challenges the validity of the findings for the dark side of the moon. And finally, for the first half of this activity, who is it who is given responsibility for saying that more research on this question is needed? And the answer to that is Gouda, or Gouda, if you prefer. So the point of this activity is that academic writers merge the voices of various sources, and the reader needs to know whose voice is speaking. So this activity draws attention to that need and to the way writers address it. Now, so far this task has been fairly straightforward because each of the ideas that the questions ask about have a citation nearby to a single source. So it's really quite easy for students to, to understand this linkage um, between an idea and the author who's being given responsibility for it. The next few questions ask about something which in my experience, and perhaps somewhat um, paradoxically, students find rather more difficult. So the question here is still, who is given or takes responsibility for these three ideas that humans have been curious about the moon for a long time, that Cheddar's study was the first to produce this finding, and that researchers don't agree about Cheddar's work. And the answer, of course, is that the writer of this example text is taking responsibility for those ideas based on his or her own understanding of the research literature. Now, unlike in the earlier cases, there's no citation to signal that. And so this brings us to another important point. Not only do academic writers merge the voices of their different sources, they also merge their sources' voices with their own. So Angel Tadra referred to this as a verl and attribution. So when we give credit to a source for an idea, we're attributing it. But when an idea is our own, we're averring it. Citations indicate attribution when a source's voice is speaking. But when the writer's own ideas are coming through, when we aver something, there's no signal for that because that's sort of the default setting. We give credit for ideas that are not our own. And if we don't give credit to someone else, 
we're claiming the credit for ourselves as, as the writer of the text. So this activity helps writers distinguish amongst voices and become attuned to the signals that, that, that authors use to do this. The second exercise is based on the same text. And it looks at something slightly different. It looks at the specific forms of attributing information to a source. And in particular, it looks at the variation in reporting language that, that writers can draw upon and how that makes a difference in conveying meaning. And this is important for several reasons. As academic readers, students need to understand the evaluation implicit in reporting language, and that's so that they can fully understand what they're reading. And in their own writing, some students have a tendency to stick with a few very neutral reporting verbs, and that has an unfortunate effect on their texts. Others, on the other hand, may try to vary the use of reporting verbs, and they need to know that there's more at stake than just variety, that it's not sort of a question of randomly choosing this reporting verb or that one. So, we have the same text. Cheddar says that the moon is made of green cheese. And the first question is, does the writer, the, the person who wrote this sample text that we're working with, does that person agree with Cheddar that the moon is made of green cheese? Or does that person disagree? Or is the writer neutral with respect to that proposition? And what we can see is that Cheddar demonstrated that the moon is made of green cheese, or is said to have demonstrated, and therefore we can assume that the writer agrees with it, demonstrates strongly, suggests that. So the next question then is, what if it said suggested? Cheddar suggested that the moon consists of high quality green tinged cheese. If it said suggested, we would probably think that the writer is a little less certain that Cheddar was right. What if it said claimed? Cheddar claimed that the moon consists of. Well, in that case, we would probably strongly suspect that the writer is about to go on and show that Cheddar was wrong. Cheddar claimed that the moon was made of green cheese, but in a later study, this was proven to be false. So that's the expectation that claim as a reporting verb would raise, while demonstrate creates the expectation that the writer agrees with that idea. Now, we also have Further down in the text, Cheddar's work has come in for criticism, for example, by Brie, 2007, who challenges the validity of the findings for the dark side of the moon. So the question, the next question is, does Brie agree with Cheddar or disagree? And the fact that Brie challenges the validity of the findings suggests that Brie does not agree. What if instead of challenged, it was suggested limitations on. Well, we'd probably understand in that case that Brie is not in complete agreement, but the criticisms are likely to be more limited. Now, what these two examples demonstrate is that through reporting verbs, writers shape the reader's thinking in two ways. In the first two questions, question one and question two, um, by picking up on demonstrate or suggest or claim, the choice of reporting verb there provides the writer's evaluation of Cheddar's idea. Was it correct or was it incorrect? In the second example, 
um, shown by questions three and four, something different is happening. The writer is not evaluating the truth of the proposition, but rather the writer is setting two different researchers in relation to each other. So there's a sense in which the writer is putting words into the mouth of Stilton and Brie. The writer is telling us what Stilton thinks of Cheddar and what Brie thinks of Cheddar. So these relatively small words are, are quite powerful and they, they pack a lot of meaning. So it's really quite important that academic writers learn to use them with nuance and a delicacy. So these first two activities have first brought the students' attention on um, how we actually distinguish whose voice is speaking in a text, and then how reporting verbs can be used to convey a lot of meaning about what those voices are saying. The third activity goes to the question of what parts of the source should be reported. So novice academic writers sometimes report a great deal of content from their sources. Any reference to a source can be accompanied by um, either a long quotation or a, a long paraphrase or summary that looks like they're trying to get everything that they read and understood into their own text. In fact, sometimes inexperienced academic writers say that they feel as if it wouldn't be honest to be selective. But in fact, proficient academic writers are very selective about what they repeat from a source. Now, obviously, we shouldn't leave out information that would distort or change the source's message, but we should include the points that help us advance our story and exclude the points that are less relevant to it. And that means, of course, that what we include depends on what story we're telling. So here's an example to concretize that. This activity is based on a figure, and again, these numbers are invented, but they're purporting to show drink consumption. Um, so how much, how many sugary drinks and how much fruit juice do people drink? And as you can see, there are several variables in addition to the type of drink. We have data for adults and data for children, and they're provided for several years. So the information in this chart could be useful for a number of different purposes. And the point of this activity is the, the, to raise awareness of the important fact that which information is useful depends on the purpose of the text. So here's the task. We give the figure to students and we tell them that they're going to be shown the beginning of two newspaper articles. And then they should use the information in the chart to add to the articles. And as we'll see, each article has a different focus. So this article is about a trend to consume fewer beverages with added sugar. And it starts with a claim that this is the case. According to a new survey by the Healthy Life Foundation, our habits have improved when it comes to what we choose to drink. So this is a claim about a trend in overall sugar consumption in drinks. So here's one example of what a good response to this task might look like. Beyond, between 1990 and 2015, the proportion of people reporting that they drank soft drinks with added sugar on a daily basis decreased steadily. So the point is that among all the different kinds of, of facts, all the different facts and information in the figure, this task asks the writer to decide which information is relevant to supporting this point and which is, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but less directly relevant. On the other hand, if the article starts with this claim, children lead the way in improving beverage habits, children are decreasing the amount of sugar they drink faster than adults are, 
then a good completion to the task might look like this, pointing out that there's been a bigger decrease in the numbers of children saying they drink sweet drinks than adults. So the, the point once again is to force writers to be selective about the information from their source that they call upon and to base that selectivity on the, the, the direct relevance, the extent to which um, a piece of information is effective in supporting a claim. There's another benefit to, to working with data, figures, tables, charts as well. And that is that it, it forces students to find their own words. So I think we're, we're all familiar with um, the idea that if we give students a source to practice um, re referring to sources from, the tendency will be to depend on the language of that source in proportion to the degree which they do or don't feel comfortable finding their own language. But if you use a graphic source like this, then there's no option. The students will have to find their own language for reporting the information from the source. So yes, facts, ideas, interpretations from sources are brought in for a reason, and that reason is closely related to the purpose of the text. And again, it's important to be clear that in being selective, we can't distort facts. If there are facts that disprove the point we're making, we need to acknowledge that. But we should have a point to make in the things we write, and the information that we report from sources is the information that speaks directly to that point. And that is something that um, students frequently need to have reinforced. So to, to wrap up, um, what are sort of the overarching points to take away from this? There are different kinds of plagiarism, and plagiarism is in inverted commas because, as I, I said toward the beginning, um, there are some people who would say that only the deceptive cheating kind actually should be called plagiarism. Warn, detect, and punish approaches only work to the extent they work at all. They only work with prototypical plagiarism. They don't address the cases of students who don't know how to write from sources in an appropriate and conventional way. So much of what looks like plagiarism, what teachers might diagnose as plagiarism, cannot be prevented unless students have the academic literacy skills to replace it. So teaching academic literacy skills can prevent plagiarism. So I guess the overarching message from this is, yes, telling students about plagiarism, trying to catch students who deceive during the assessment process and penalizing them, those are fair activities, but the biggest role that EAP teachers can have in preventing plagiarism comes simply through raising these important academic literacy skills. Now, that's pretty much all I had. My references are on this slide if they're, if they're of interest to anybody. And apart from that, I'd just like to say thank you. This has been a little bit monologic so far, so I hope there are some questions. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, please write any questions you have. We've had um, a few uh, in the questions box, but please enter any questions you'd like me to put it down and I'll, I'll try and do a few in the time that we have remaining. I've just seen a really good one there. It said, can you plagiarise yourself? <laughs> Meaning mm -hmm. if you're referring to previous, what does it say, as in if you use materials you had previously written for some other assignment, is it acceptable to use again? Yeah, that that actually this question of self plagiarism is perhaps one of one of the most contentious ones. And plagiarism is a topic that, that where there's a lot of disagreement, but perhaps especially when it comes to self plagiarism, I I think there there are just there isn't a single answer to that. But there are a couple of principles we can intend to. So is it acceptable? Well, that depends on the terms of engagement, right? And I think most teachers would say um, 
if you're if you're writing if you've written an essay for one class and you're thinking can i hand it in for another one what's the purpose of the essay the purpose is to help the teacher assess whether you have actually mastered the learning objectives in that class an essay that you wrote for another class wouldn't do that so that wouldn't be acceptable to me um, on the other hand i'd say that as teachers we have a responsibility to be as creative in our assessments as we hope our students will be in answering them so if a teacher is giving an essay assignment that can be used in two different courses, um, I kind of say, well, those teachers should perhaps up their game. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Could you, uh, sorry, one point here, could, somebody's asking, what, while I ask you the next question, could you show the, the um, references slide again, please? Absolutely. Or at and least I'll... I will try to. There we go. <laughs> there you go, yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, it's showing your, it doesn't matter, I think you can see most, you probably see most of that there. Um, yeah, a, another question here is, and this is maybe a cultural one, um, there's a few different points around students just not having the skills and not knowing. I, I, is that a cultural thing? Do, do some students come to class not even knowing that plagiarism is, is an issue? Yeah, so those are actually two slightly different questions. They're definitely. Um, in, in some classrooms, in some contexts, students, some students come to university, might even be starting a postgraduate course, not knowing that plagiarism is even a thing. Now, is that cultural? A lot of people have asserted that it is. Um, a lot of, of other people with a great deal of expertise have responded with respect to given cultures and, and said, no, it, it's, it's, it's nonsense to think that culture explains this. Educational experience explains it. Skills, what's been taught in skill, school explains it. Um, I, I'm very persuaded by some of the things that have been written by people who challenge the cultural explanation. There's a very good um, art paper written by Yong Yan Li and John Flowerdew in um, a a book that Philip Shaw and I um, recently co-edited, um, Student Plagiarism in Higher Education. And they take on this question of the idea that's often repeated that Chinese students are particularly likely to plagiarize. And they produce a lot of evidence that really calls that into question. Um, regardless of whether that's true or not, though, I think we have to be really cautious about accepting the cultural explanation for this reason, if we start believing that students from country X don't know about plagiarism, and that's why they write in ways that repeat their sources, the temptation is to say, right, I'll tell them what plagiarism is. And then if they do it again, that must mean that they intended to cheat. In fact, going back to the main message, um, if a student hasn't been alerted to what plagiarism is and how not to do it, that student probably also has not developed the academic literacy skills that are necessary to be able to avoid it. Hmm. Okay, good. Uh, there was an, just another point, actually. I've got a few questions. There's lots coming in. This is good, um, if I can find it again. Um, it's about students basically um, having too much to learn already when they arrive maybe in a pre-sessional year when their language level is really low and, and maybe all of this is, is just too much for them. I don't know if you had uh, anything to comment on, on about that. Well, absolutely. It's definitely the case around the world that students are being put into English medium instruction, English language classrooms, um, when their level of English is is not right, not not there yet, um, and we see that you know in places around the world where English medium instruction is spreading. We see it when international students go to to the UK and to Australia and to the US and Canada and so on, and the the, the skills that are required to write academic texts are just very high level and very complex. So as long as we have students studying through the medium of English when their language skills are, are not yet at the point where they can undertake academic activity in English. As long as we have students like that, we will have plagiarism. 
So is there anything, uh, another question is about the lower levels, you know, what, what sort of levels should these techniques be taught at? But is there any anything we can do for the lower level students, for these lower level students? Right. Um, so if you if you in the position of preparing students this semester to go into the, the, the mainstream classroom next semester, um, what you can do is sort of teach these ideas because they need to know it and you can adapt the, the sample texts and you can adapt the questions and you can adapt the vocabulary to to make it accessible to them. Um, so if students are, are, are in the EAP classroom, they need to be learning these things and sure. because they will be held responsible for, for their knowledge of them or not. Um, and so then it just becomes a, a, a question in using the vocabulary, the structures, the texts, that sort of thing to make them accessible. Uh, the point here from Peter, um, he just says, he's making quite a good point that, um, have you found that this problem is exclusively limited to speakers of English as a second language, given that nobody's first language is academic discourse? This is also yeah. surely a problem for native speakers as well. Yeah, yes. Um, so that, that, that um, quotation from Bourdieu is entirely opposite. Writing academic discourse is nobody's mother tongue and this is a this is a problem for absolutely everybody. Um, Shelley Angelil Carter wrote a, a, a brilliant book in, in I think 2000, set in the South African context. And one of the things she showed was that that first and second language users of English at a South African university used the same strategies, had the same issues, but it didn't get detected in the work of the first language users because they were able, to, their teachers were more likely to believe that the Polish language was authentically theirs. Um, there's also been work done to suggest that um, if, we, if we think about sort of this act of patch writing, uh, the idea that, as Howard described it, the idea that you take, uh, you know, a sentence from here and a sentence from there and you stitch them together in, into a sort of patchwork quilt. There's evidence to suggest that the more proficient second language users and first language users um, borrow shorter strings. So there's a developmental trajectory that, that absolutely um, you know, is there for everybody. And of course, it's important to say that this is not only a problem for English. Uh, we, the, the research is on the topic is predominantly in English um, because of the status English has as, as the world's language. But this is a problem for everybody learning academic discourse, regardless of the language they're working in. Excellent. Uh, just another two quick, quick ones, I think, because that's all we've got time for. Thank you, people, uh, everybody, for the questions that we've got coming through. Um, how is plagiarism punished? There was a, a few questions around this, and what, um, what 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 do universities do? Is it an individual basis? Is there a a, a known way of dealing with plagiarism with students? Yeah, there's a great deal of diversity in practice across universities around the world. Um, the UK is possibly coming the closest to standardizing. There's a movement for, for universities to, to create penalty tariffs and uh, uh, I think also an informal movement to, to align those across universities. Um, but there, there's huge variety in practice, and it can be any and in policy as well. And it can be anything from um, a, a reducing a grade or giving zero marks for the assignment, um, a failure for the course, suspension, expulsion in extreme cases. It's important to say that a lot of how plagiarism is handled is informally, because a lot of teachers find that it's really um, very bothersome and, you know, indeed sometimes anguishing to report cases of plagiarism. So, how do universities handle it? Well, their their policies and their procedures, and then there's a whole lot of informal handling going on in the classroom that sort of doesn't get onto on onto the radar. Thank you. Just squeeze another one in, I think. Um, just sort of on, on that, uh, Umut has written, normally up to 15% um, similarity is accepted within writing text. Do you agree with this percentage um, or what kind of threshold might there might there be? 
Oh, I so don't want to be disagreeable, but I have to. No, I don't agree with that percentage, and I don't agree with any percentage. And it is, it is a huge mistake to take any number, whatever it is, as a boundary between the acceptable and the unacceptable. Um, and in fact, if if you read the, the sort of fine print on instructions from Turnitin and Urkund and these other products, they will always tell you that. Although busy teachers who want an objective frame of reference, um, it, it's a natural impulse to reach for a, a threshold figure like that. But there is no such thing as a good threshold, and it's very, very dangerous for reasons we don't have time to go into now. It, it's a really bad idea to try and apply some sort of threshold figure. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'll just do one more. Hope you don't mind. So we're keeping you uh, talking here. But um, I mean, basically, the question from a lot of people is how can we find a way to stop plagiarism from the internet? And what's the role of the teacher here? This is a big question. Yeah. Um, so internet plagiarism comes in in a number of, of varieties, and at, at one level, it's no different from any other kind of plagiarism. If you have students who are sort of at a loss for how they can start their writing assignment, and they go online and they find something and they say, "Wow, this person wrote it so much better than I ever could," um, we, we we have to teach our way out of that kind of problem. So that means doing things like um, Giving giving assessments that, that can't be copied, the, um, working with a writing process so that students are given structured scaffolded steps to go through and enabling them to do their own writing and helping them to understand that the, the objective isn't the text, the objective is the, the, the process that helps them learn on the way to producing the text. Um, so, in, in that sense, yes, we have the internet now, but before there was an internet, students who didn't know how to get started on their writing assessment were going to the library and taking books off shelves and, and doing precisely the same thing. Um, they're, they're, that, that's an issue that deserves a, a, a better answer than this very fast one. But in my book, Teaching to Avoid Plagiarism, I, I, I do spend quite a lot of time on that. Um, one of the really troubling issues is contract cheating. And again, that's not you, but the internet has made it so much easier for a student to pay somebody else in some other part of the world to write their assessed work for them. And that is incredibly difficult to catch. Text comparison tools like Turnitin um, can't catch that. Um, but there is work being done on on sort of how we stop the 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 people who are doing this and what the characteristics of the organizations are that do it, and also some work on detecting contract cheating. Lovely. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for that, Dan. That was that was really good. Very interesting, actually. Lots of good. <laughs>